We begin our study of trigonometry with some discussion about angles. So here we have the definition from geometry of an angle. We're told that it's made by two rays with a common endpoint. The rays, like BC right here and BA, are the sides of the angle. And the common endpoint of the two rays, this point B, is called the vertex. And over here on the right you see what you've learned in geometry about the typical ways to name an angle. As long as there's a single angle there, we can name it just by its vertex. And here's one version of a symbol that goes with the name of an angle. You'll also see uh, angles that are named by using that little angle symbol with an arc through it to indicate again that it's an angle. That it's a thing of rotation. So we can name it by its vertex. Oftentimes, especially in more complicated diagrams, you'll see little numbers tucked off in close to the vertex and we can refer to the angle then as angle one. That's always a nice uh, convention because in a complicated diagram if there happens to be several angles that share the particular vertex, in this case B, then the only way to name those angles so that everybody looking at the diagram knows which angle in particular you're talking about is to have a point on each of the two sides of the angle and put the name of the vertex in the middle. So we could name this angle ABC or angle CBA. The direction there is not important as long as the B for the point B is in the middle. And one other point to uh, make, no pun intended, is when we talk about the point B, we name points in the geometric setting and in the mathematical setting in general with uh, capital letters. So again, most of you probably know everything that I've just told you. But in mathematics, especially uh, in the early stages of mathematics, we sacrifice language and definitions and mastery of those things for learning how to do processes, and we consider that mathematics. But it's really not. Mathematics is a, is a language all its own. It's very symbolic. And if we don't know the definitions and the particular details, sooner or later, it's going to come back to haunt us. So as we go through some things here that are pretty basic to you, uh, pick up on the details that somehow have escaped you. One of the common ways of referring to angles in the trigonometric setting that you'll become accustomed to hearing is to refer to an angle as being in standard position. And here's what standard position looks like. Standard position. An angle is said to be in standard position if one side of the angle is attached to the positive x-axis. So we're talking about now putting our angle into a coordinate plane. So it says, here let me change the color, it says that one of the sides is a, attached to or fixed to the positive x-axis and then the other side is free to rotate in either direction, clockwise or counterclockwise, away from that first side. And there's some additional language here. This first side is referred to as the initial side. And the second side is called the terminal side. Sounds kind of deadly, doesn't it? But it gets its meaning from more like the word terminating. It's where the 
the angle ends. Understand that unlike in the geometric setting where angles are limited to 180 degrees, think about the protractor postulate if you remember it, in the trig setting there's no limit on the size of the angle so we can talk about not necessarily being interested in this amount of rotation as being our angle we might actually be looking at the much larger rotation in the clockwise direction so we need to keep in mind again the language pick up the details because it's in the reading and you'll be held accountable for it because it's written it's one of the common phraseologies in talking about an angle um, and it's quite common to see an angle in this context of the coordinate plane where in standard position the angle has its initial side on the positive x-axis and it's quite common to analyze an angle regardless of the setting that it initially is in in terms of uh, in our minds at least putting in a set of axes so that we can visualize the angle in its standard position. Here we are back to a clean picture of an angle in standard form. Based on the discussion we just had we could be looking at this as one of two angles and notice that when we look at this part we're looking at an obtuse angle but we could also be looking at it as we've just discussed as the rotation in this direction and obviously those are two distinctly different angles in, in terms of their rotation and the, together they represent a pair of angles that is very important to us mathematically. This is called a pair of coterminal angles and here's the definition. Now it says two or more standard position angles that have exactly the same terminal side and hopefully one of the first things that pops into your mind is well how do you get more than two you can see that we have this pair that together complete a, a single rotation of 360 degrees around a circle and why not just define them as a pair of angles in standard position the sum of whose measures is 360 degrees. It, from this diagram, it, it, that looks plausible. Well, the problem with it is uh, you don't know yet that one of the valuable things that trigonometry does for us is allows us to analyze circular motion uh, when things are spinning. Think about the analysis that goes into the wheel of a car. When you think about how you calibrate the odometer and the speedometer in terms of the rate at which that tire is spinning, well trigonometry allows us to do quite a bit with things that spin. So not only are we talking about, when we talk about coterminal angles, angles that have this same terminal side, we're talking about angles that we've arrived at not in the first time around the circle, but maybe multiple times around the circle. Whether we're going counterclockwise or we're going in the clockwise direction. So you can see that if, there's, if we're allowed to spin and have angles that are of any size we want, we can generate an infinite number of angles that all terminate in this same terminal side. Now, talking about clockwise and counterclockwise is 
is okay, but it's kind of clumsy, and what we're really talking about is two opposite directions. Aha! Based on the example that we have here right in front of us, with the axes, we know how to deal with direction by assigning positive to one direction and negative to the other. Well, we've got two motions that spin in opposite directions. Logic would say in the mathematical setting that one of those motions, one of those spins is going to be positive and the other spin negative. And if you were to guess, I would think that most of us would guess that the clockwise motion is the positive motion. After all, we grow up watching these circular clocks, whether they're actually circular or not, their faces are, where the hands move in what we refer to as clockwise, meaning if we were thinking in terms of spinning from the y-axis, we'd be spinning to the right. And I say the y-axis because, after all, that's where 12 o'clock is, and that's kind of where we look at the rotation on the clock starting. But now we're starting on the positive x-axis. No big deal. However, how do we go about determining which direction is going to be positive and which direction is going to be negative? Well, it goes back to, again, something very logical. If you look at the angles that can be included in a triangle, they are going to be angles that fall somewhere in the first or the, or the second quadrant, the way we number them. And if you throw into that the fact that in this first quadrant, we're looking at points that have a pair of positive coordinates instead of fourth quadrant, you've got one positive, one negative. So historically, we chose the counterclockwise as being the positive rotation and clockwise as being negative. And uh, that's an important other feature about angles in trigonometry besides the fact that they can be infinitely large. They can be infinitely large positive or infinitely large negative depending on which direction we're spinning. In light of this discussion, it seems to me that our current definition for coterminal angles falls way short of conveying to us all of the information that we really want concerning coterminal angles. And here we see the upgraded version. It's more complete. So if you're taking notes, I would put a big X through this one, for the, through the first one as being yeah, kind of okay. But what we have here in this new one is more on the lines of a complete definition that will convey to us exactly what we mean with coterminal angles. So the first part is pretty much the same, but the second sentence and, and on is more precise. The angles have the same terminal side, but they have different measures, and as we talked about in the first time around the circle, either positive or negative, you get a pair of angles that have a sum of 360 degrees together. But if we look at the first negative one, if we look at actually all of our coterminal angles in terms of this first positive one, we can say that all of the other coterminal angles will have a measure that's either plus or minus 360 degrees times the number of rotations that have occurred. So even uh, if we look at the first negative one, if we add a negative 360 degrees to our first positive angle, we're going to end up at this negative rotation. If for each successive addition of negative 360 degrees, we'll just go around the circle and go around the circle and go around the circle. Same thing with the positive. So this definition not only tells you what to look for in a diagram in terms of coterminal angles, it also tells you how to calculate 
the measures of each successive uh, coterminal angle.